Life and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Herbert Marshall in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Auto Life presents part one of the most famous of all literary puzzles, Charles Dickens' unfinished novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. Our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Well, if it isn't Oscar, the singing limousine. Every car sings when it's got what I've got, Arlo. Ah, uh, you don't have to tell me, Oscar, I know. You've got ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. The spark plugs that are world famous for quality and performance. I'm starting to hear right, Harlow. Now, you sure are, Oscar, because Autolite spark plugs are ignition-engineered to give top performance at all times. They're specified as original equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars, trucks, and tractors. My Autolite spark plug dealer told me spark plugs were the very heart of my ignition system. And he was right, too. So, friends, have your spark plugs checked by your nearest dealer who sells Autolite spark plugs. To quickly locate him, just look for the Autolite spark plug sign or phone Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents Charles Dickens' The Mystery of Edwin Drood, starring Mr. Herbert Marshall hoping once again to keep you in suspense. This is the last night I have to live, and I will set down the naked truth without disguise. I was never a brave man, but the task comes without much difficulty. I can speak of myself as if I had already passed from the world. For while I write this, my grave is digging, and my name is inscribed in the Black Book of Death. It was in the organ loft of the assembly hall at Cloisterham College where I first began to learn how a man's mind can become a thing of horrible wonder, a part, a writhing, tormented thing beyond his poor power to control. I'd gone there, as I so often did, for the peace and quiet, for the song of birds, the scents from gardens and woods that joined with me and my music. And it was there, suddenly without warning, that my mind filled with those words, words long forgotten, only half learned at best somewhere in the dim past. When the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness, he shall save his soul alive. The wicked man? What has that to do with me, with John Jasper? Simple instructor in music. Jack! And why should I be filled with a strange sense of guilt? Are you in there, Jack? The wicked man. Me? The wicked man. Jack! Are you in the organ, love? Jack? Well, uh, who's that? It's I, Jack, your nephew, Edwin Drew. Edwin. I'm out here in the assembly hall. Edwin. Edwin, my boy. Jack. Jack, it's good to see you again. Let me see what the past three months have done for you. Uh -huh. I can't say they've done you a bit of harm. <laughs> no reason why they should. But tell me of yourself. You look a little tired. Tired? Nonsense. Never felt that in my life. Not worried about something, are you? Some strain you're under, perhaps? In this sleepy old college town... Oh, here, come into my office. We're wasting all this time in talk. I've been saving a special welcome for you, my boy. Sit down and rest your weary bones while I make it ready. Oh, oh Jack. Jack, I'm truly home again. I can see that now. No wonder you love it here at Cloistrum. Is that what you think, Edwin? <laughs> Who could think otherwise, looking at you? You're respected... Your talent for teaching music admired and looked up to? You'd be duty-bound to love it. You're wrong, Edwin. I hate it. What? I hate it. Jack, I'd never dreamed. Well, no, no, let there be an end to such talk, Edwin. We've delayed our toast much too long as it is. 
to your future, Edwin. I know, Jack. Hold on. I'll not make that the first toast upon my return. Oh? Why not? There's a much better one to drink to on this day of all days. To my future wife, Rosa. Of course, Edwin. To Rosa. As we stood there, Edwin and I drinking to her, to Rosa, I began to realize why those words about the wicked man had come to me just before his return. It had been a warning, a warning that might have already come too late. Have I startled you? Why, why, no, Mr. Jasper. It was only that I... You were expecting someone else? Well, uh, Edwin said that he might get here early. I'm sorry I disappointed you then. Oh, no, it isn't that, really. Oh, I'm being quite rude, aren't I? Please come in. Thank you, my dear. Oh, you look most charming, Rosa. I'd swear that gown was purchased in London expressly for your party tonight. Oh, you surprise me, Mr. Jasper. I didn't know you were so observant as concerning women. Concerning women, Rosa? Or you? Why, me? I'm only one of your music students. No, no. You're a good deal more than that to me, Rosa. I'll open the parlor. We can wait there for the other guests. You said I was a good deal more to you than just a music student. What did you mean? Edwin's my nephew. You're his betrothed. Surely the love I bear for him extends to you also. Oh, I, I hadn't thought of your feelings toward me in just that way. Had you thought of them then? Allow me to be frank, Mr. Jasper. I'm going to marry Edwin despite the fact that I do not love him. You do not? Oh, he's a brother. Perhaps he's a very dear friend. But not as one should love a husband. Then, why marry him, Rosa? Because I couldn't bear to see him hurt. Because I promised both my parents and his that we would marry. There's nothing that can change your mind? No, Mr. Jasper. Not even if you loved another? I do love another. The other guest. Rosa. Oh, excuse me, please. I, I must let them in. <laughs> I remember little concerning the party that followed, being too occupied with my own thoughts. But two incidents do stand out as foreshadowing events to come. The first, a conversation between Dean Chris Barkle and his protege, Neville Landless, a strange and intense young man, but newly arrived from Ceylon. Yes, of course, my dear. She's a beautiful girl, Dean. <laughs> One of the most beautiful it has ever been my fortune to meet. It uh, might be best for you to curb your admiration, Neville. Rose is already spoken for. In Ceylon, that is not always a reason. I need hardly remind you, my boy, that this is Cloisterham in England. I warrant her fiancé would not take too kindly to your attitude. Fiancé? Young Edwin Drood. Ah, yes. I now understand his air of proprietorship. Obviously, he is not one who appreciates his good fortune. May I ask, Mr. Oh. Landis, the exact meaning of your remark concerning me and Rosa? Edwin, really, I... I, I don't know mind, that you... Mr. Drood. It seemed to me that you were taking the young lady in question rather for granted. I merely commented on it. A manner of comment that hardly comes under the heading of civility in England, Mr. Landis. Though perhaps your somewhat heathen background may account for Oh, oh come now, gentlemen, this is hard to Nor does it seem very civil for you to comment so upon a stranger here, one who has not had your uh, so-called advantages in upbringing. Perhaps the best civility is to mind our own business. If you will set me that example, I promise to follow it. You take too much upon yourself, sir. In my part of the world, you will be called to account for it. By whom, for instance, Mr. Francis? By me, sir. At your earliest convenience. Oh, gentlemen, gentlemen, please. Edwin, Edwin, let's have no more of this. I word between the two of you. I don't like it, my boy. Nor do I care for certain comments made in my presence here, Jack. This is hardly a matter of moment, Edwin. We are all hosts here to Mr. Landless, a stranger newly arrived. 
You should respect the obligations of hospitality. Shall it be over, then? So far as I'm concerned, Jack, there's no anger left. Mr. Landless? None, Mr. Jasper. So be it, then. The incident is over. When it became time for Rosa to play, I took my place at the piano beside her in order to turn the pages of the music. I stood there watching, watching her hands caressing the keys like two white tender doves, seeing her lips pursed tenderly in concentration, the curve of her soft cheek, her eyes intent upon her music, yet finding moments free to glance up into mine. A tide of emotion welled up within me as I watched. And then I saw it begin to overtake her, too. It was evident in the trembling of her hands, the color draining from her face, her quickening breath. Oh, no, I, I can't bear it. I can't bear it. Oh, take me away. Please no. take me away. No. It was then the decision was made. It was then I knew that the end result was as fixed in time as the inexorable approach of death. In this instance, the death of Edwin Brood. Bringing you Mr. Herbert Marshall in Charles Dickens' The Mystery of Edwin Drood. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. you're in for the ride of a car's lifetime. The Autolite Resistor Spark Plug is the greatest advancement in spark plugs for automotive use in the past 25 years. They sure step up my performance. That's because Autolite Resistor Spark Plugs have something extra that gives you something extra. That extra is an exclusive Autolite built-in 10,000 ohm resistor that makes possible such extra advantages as smoother engine performance, quick starts, and double spark plug life. Hello. Right you are, Oscar, and the Autolite resistor-type spark plug is only one of the complete line of Autolite spark plugs for every use. So, friends, see your nearest Autolite spark plug dealer. Have him check and replace worn-out spark plugs with ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, either standard or resistor type. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Herbert Marshall in Elliot Lewis's production of The Mystery of Edwin Drood, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I have said that a man's mind can become a thing of horrible wonder, a part. So it must have been with mine that night. For I know now that the plan, the complete, the perfect plan, was born the very moment that Edwin Drew led Rosa from the room. Oh, the poor girl. She's quite evidently overwrought. Yes, quite overwrought. Little wonder with the strain she's had to bear. It can hardly be conducive to one's nerves when a fiancé becomes proprietary and overbearing. It would appear that your earlier differences with Ben Drood still rankle, Mr. Landless. I believe I have my anger well under control, Mr. Jasper. But the same can hardly be said for the circumstances that provoke Oh, me. come now, Neville. It is hardly becoming to maintain such a disagreeable attitude. Hardly becoming, perhaps, but a natural reaction. And one that can be as naturally overcome... And just how would you suggest this to be done, sir? Through friendly discussion over a friendly nightcap, Mr. Landless. Shall we stay at my gatehouse? Within the hour? Will Drood be amenable? 
He's already accepted my invitation. Then I shall accept also. Thank you, Mr. Landis. You shall not regret it, I assure you. I took my leave then and pursued my way through the silent cobbled streets of Cloisterham. My path led me beside the city's venerable crypt. That strange jumble of old walls, ancient druidic stone, and decaying monuments, wherein dwelt the bones of centuries of Cloisterham's dead. Upon reaching it, I forsook the cobblestones of the street for the rubble of the crypt. You wear that there mound by the yard gate, Mr. Jasper. Oh, is that you, Duddles? Aye. Well, what was it you said? I said, wear the mound, Mr. Jasper. Why, uh, what is it? Lime, that's what. Lime? What you call quick lime? Aye, quick enough to eat your bones and your boots. With a little handy stirring, quick enough, surely, to eat your bones. Really? Now, you, you use it in your stonemason work, do you? Aye. Oh, it's little enough stone work for Durdles these days. What with the mayor and them wanting to learn where the old ones is. Oh, yes. Searching for the final resting places of ancient druids, aren't you? Aye. Try and task it is, too. What with the way they're buried here, without no rhyme, no reason. Scattered about like in walls and under passageways. At best, I'd say it was an impossible task. That was... <laughs> not for Durdles and his armor, it's not. Hammer? How can that possibly help? Well, look you over here, Mr. Jasper. Here's a wall. Take it is. Over six feet. Crumbling bad in spots. Hard to tell just what might be buried there, if anything. But Durdles will soon put an end to that mystery. I taps, you see. Solid here. An old one. So I goes on tapping. Hollow here. Nothing. I tap some more. Here I find solid. Huh? Hollow again. There you have it, Mr. Jasper. Walls hollow. Oh, filled with rubbish and what not, I wager, but hollow plain enough. Like most of the walls around here. Plenty of room in them for a hundred more bodies, it need be. Yes, I dare say. Well, thank you kindly for the most illuminating lecture. Well, no. You didn't say why you come visiting here in the first place, Mr. Jasper. I... I don't believe I know, Durdles. I don't believe I know. When I arrived at my lodgings, Edward was already there. And no sooner had we got the fire blazing and made ourselves comfortable than Neville Landless put in his appearance. Please to sit down, Mr. Landless. Whatever small comfort you find here, consider to be your own. My thanks, Mr. Jasper. Turn up the lamp on the desk, will you, Edwin? I'll prepare some mulled wine for that nightcap I promised. Of course, Jack. You'll probably notice, Mr. Landis, that I have the lamp so arranged as to illuminate the painting over the chimney place. I had noticed it, Mr. Jasper. You'll recognize the subject, of course. Miss Rosa, I could hardly fail to do so, though the portrait is far from flattering to the original. <laughs> Don't be so hard on it, Mr. Landis. It was done by Edwin, who made me a present of it. I'm sorry, Mr. Drood. If I had known I was in the... Artist's presence. I doubt that your remark would have differed, Mr. Landis. Perhaps it would not have, Mr. Drood. Oh, come now, gentlemen. Let there be no more of this. The wine is prepared. So. And surely no lady, or at least the portrait of one, should intrude upon the drinking habits of good friends. For you, Mr. Landis. Thank you, sir. Edwin. My thanks, Jack. And now, for the first toast of the evening, I should like to propose one to my nephew. A most fortunate man. A toast in truth, Mr. Jasper. I shall drink to it. Thank you both, gentlemen. Yes, Mr. Landless, I ask you to observe my nephew, for he is indeed one of the most fortunate men of the world. And an enviable state, if I truly possess it, Jack. How could you doubt it, my boy? A family estate that eliminates the burdens of economic necessity. Rosa, 
eager, waiting to supply you with the greatest blessings of domestic bliss and love. Quite different from your prospects and mine, is it not, Mr. Randless? Yes, quite different, Mr. Jaster. Upon <laughs> my soul, Jack, I almost feel apologetic for having my way smoothed, as you describe. Almost, but not quite. Perhaps it might have been better for Mr. Drew to have known some hardships in the achievement of his possessions. And why, pray, might it have been better for Mr. Drew to have known hardships? Yes, Mr. Landers. Tell us why. Because they might have made him more sensible of good fortune that is not the result of his own merit. Have you known hardships, may I ask? I have. And what have they made you sensible of? I have told you once before tonight. You've told me nothing. I told you that you take a great deal too much upon yourself. You added something else to that, if I remember. I did. I said that in my part of the world, you would be called to account for it. <laughs> that part of the world is a long way off, I believe. A very safe distance. Stay here, then. Stay anywhere that gentlemen may be found. What would you know of gentlemen, Landis? You may know a common thief or a common boaster when you see him, but you're surely no judge of gentlemen. I have taken all I'm going to take from you. Here now, Edwin. Stand still. Mr. Landis, give me that bottle. I'll give it to your precious nephew. I warn you, Drood. I'll cut you down someday for this. I swear it. The scene had gone well, I thought. Very well. And after Landis's enraged departure, after I had calmed Edwin down and sent him home, I waited for what I knew would follow. It was close to midnight when it did. Uh, may I come in, Jasper? Of course, Dean. I, uh, I understand you had some uh, difficulty with my protege tonight. He told you? Oh, there was no overlooking his wrought-up state when he came home. I questioned him at once. He must have been rather... Difficult. Murderous might be a more exact term. Murderous? Oh, surely you exaggerate, Jasper. I hardly think so. But what could justify the use of such an expression? The facts. I feel certain that if I had not been there to intervene, he would have laid Edwin dead at his feet. Oh, unbelievable. And yet he did repeat to me the warning he gave young Drood. That he'd cut him down someday? His exact words, Jasper. I think, sir, that you have in your charge a most dangerous man. One who might well attempt to carry out his threat against Edwin's life. Oh, no, 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 I can't believe that, Jasper. I'm confident that if we could get them together again, get them to shake hands upon it, all their differences could be resolved. You're much more optimistic than I. Surely it's worth a try for your nephew's sake, if for no other. Talk to him, I'll talk with Neville. I know he'll meet with Drood whenever and wherever you say it. Very well, Dean, I'll try. Though I say to you now, and you are my witness, I'm convinced that unless Neville Landis leaves Cloisterham, the end result could be nothing but tragedy. It was two days later that Dean Crisparkle brought me assurance of Neville's willingness to cooperate. Immediately I sought out Edwin Drood for a dinner on Christmas Eve, just the three of us. And so the stage was set. And the hours flew, and the ugly streets of Cloisterham turned bright and gay with the holly and the mistletoe. The dinner in my lodgings went cheerfully and well that Christmas Eve. The holiday spirit burned as brightly as the fire in the hearth. There was peace on earth to all men of goodwill. Not even the unseasonable storm that began to rage outside could dampen the gaiety of the evening. Rather, it served as a challenge. An opportunity to heighten the feeling of good fellowship that seemed to be born that night. It was sometime around midnight when the two men, arm in arm, took their departure. You would suggest something like this, Jack. Then going to see the river at this hour on Christmas Eve. Only a madman would suggest. And only two young madmen such as you would take up such a suggestion, if indeed you are to take it up. Nothing could stop me from it now, Mr. Jasper. It's unbelievable that that sluggish, muddy stream could ever become a raging torrent. Nevertheless, you'll find it a soul, Mr. Landless. One of the few worthwhile sights to behold in Cloisterham. Our river, reborn at the height of a storm. I warn you to be careful, however. 
The footing would be treacherous. <laughs> you're a wicked man, Jack. To inflame us over the idea and then attempt to draw us back. Well, you'll not succeed in stopping us now, eh, Neville? No, Edward. Nothing will stop us now. Then come along. We'll be on our merry way. I can tell you the night that followed, for there is little that I remember clearly. I know only that when dawn finally broke, I found myself in the organ loft, playing, my clothing wet through, and burning within my brain was a memory. A memory of a man walking alone through the wind and rain in the black of night. A man walking through the deserted streets of Cloisterham, the streets that suddenly unknown to him, were no longer deserted. of Christmas morn, there was one thing I did know. Edwin's room would never be seen again. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite, world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. They are members of the Autolite family, as well as are the 98,000 Autolite distributors and dealers in the United States and thousands more in Canada and throughout the world. Our family also includes the nearly 30,000 men and women in 28 great Autolite plants from coast to coast and Autolite plants in many foreign countries, as well as the 18,000 people who have invested a portion of their savings in Autolite. Every Autolite product is backed by constant research and precision built to the highest standards of quality and performance. So remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. Next week, part two of Charles Dickens' unfinished novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood, at which time we will attempt to solve this literary puzzle. Our star, once again, Mr. Herbert Marshall. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morawick and conducted by Lou Gluskin. The Mystery of Edwin Drood was adapted from Charles Dickens' unfinished novel by Sidney Marshall. In tonight's story, Terry Kilburn was heard as Edwin Drood, Betty Harford as Rosa, Ben Wright as Landless, Joseph Kearns as Dean Crisparkle, and William Johnstone as Durdles. Autolite stay-full batteries and Autolite electrical parts 
at your neighborhood Autolite dealer. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is the CBS Radio Network. And its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Herbert Marshall in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents part two of one of the most famous of all literary puzzles, Charles Dickens' unfinished novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. Our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Hello, Senator. How's our legislative leader? Hello. What's this I hear about you being up for assault and battery? Oh, that's a stay-full battery, Senator. The Autolite stay-full. That fit, fine, and famous battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Then you're not in trouble. No, not with an Autolite stay-full, Senator. Fiberglass mats protect every positive plate against shedding and flaking to give the Autolite stay-full battery longer life as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. And my Autolite battery dealer will substantiate that story, Harlow? He sure will, Senator. And he's the expert who services all makes of batteries. Friends, to quickly locate your nearest Autolite battery dealer, call Western Union by number... And ask for Operator 25. I'll gladly tell you the name of your nearest Autolite battery dealer, where you can get an Autolite stay-full. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents Charles Dickens' The Mystery of Edwin Drood, starring Mr. Herbert Marshall, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. <laughs> When the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness, he shall save his soul alive. So it has been said. So it has been written. But what of him who strives to turn away in torment and desperation and finds that he cannot? What is it that will happen to him? What is it that will happen to me? Christmas morn that I, John Jasper, instructor in music at Cloistron College, sought the answers to those questions. I sought them within myself, within my music, within the paling stars seen dimly through the organ locked windows. But no answers came, only a memory or a dream. I seemed to see a man walking alone through the deserted night-blackened streets of Cloistrum, the deserted streets which were suddenly no longer deserted. lodgings, looking for him who should have been there, looking for the man I suddenly knew would never be there again. Edwin! Edwin! Chris Parker! Dean Chris Parker, open up! He went to the river last night to look at the storm with Neville Landless. With Neville? 
Yes, but he never came back. Where is he? Oh. Ask Landless where he is. Neville's not home either. Not home? I, I, I'll be down directly. As he joined me, the brave realization of what might have transpired was clearly writ upon Dean Chris Parker's face. Hurriedly, he roused a number of cottage servants from their holiday beds, and a search was begun. A search for my missing nephew, Edwin Drood, and for the Dean's missing protege, Neville Landless. There it is. The river. The river they went to see at the height of the storm last night. You... You never saw them again, Jasper? No, neither one returned. Was there any quarrel between them? Any hint of the disagreements they'd had upon another occasion? None. The Christmas Eve dinner had gone exactly as I'd planned. They'd shaken hands. Uh, Apparently resolved their differences. And when they left, they went arm in arm. Uh, tell me, Jasper. Whose idea was it to visit the river? Was it Neville's? I'll not cast doubt that may be undeserved. It could have been anyone's suggestion. Mine, Edwin's. I don't like this, Jasper. Uh, there's a feeling about it all that strikes chill to my bones. Oh, hark, one of the searching parties. They found someone, Jasper. They found... You take yes. your hands off me. What right have you Edwin to see my person like this? Easy, just uh, now. Come off. Easy, if you please, Mr. Landis. Take your hands off me. What right have you to... Seize my person like this, will you? Kick them off me! In a moment, sir, in a moment. Ah, there you be, Dean Chris Parker. We found your man, as you see. Yes, Joe, I see. You may release him. Aye, sir. But it's belligerent he is. I'd be aware of him if I was you. Didn't want to return with us at all, he didn't. What is all this, sir? What is the meaning? I was out for an early morning walk when these blackguards seized me bodily. They forced me to return here and said it was by your orders. As it was, Neville. But why, sir? Surely there's some explanation. Why? Where is my nephew, Landless? Your nephew? Yes, Edwin Drood. Where is he? Why ask me? Why should I know of Drood's whereabouts? Because you were the last person in his company, and he's huh? not to be found. Speak, sir. Where is he? Uh, stay, stay, Jasper. Permit me to question him. Uh, uh, Neville, you left Mr. Jasper's residence last night with Edwin Drood? I? Uh, yes, sir. You went down to the river together? Yes, to see the reaction of the storm upon it. How long did you stay there? Oh, well, sir... Uh, Oh, ten minutes, more or less. And then? What well, Drew took leave of me. Did he say where he was going, well, then? yes, to return to Mr. Jasper's. That was the last you saw of him? The very last. If something's happened to Drew, I most certainly had nothing to do with it. What are those stains upon your jacket, Mr. Landless? Huh? The stains? And that walking stick you're carrying, Joe. The same stains are upon it. Aye, so they are. Bloodstains they be, Mr. Jasper. And the stick, to whom does that belong? Why, to Mr. Landis, sir. We took it off. Had to, the fuss and all he was putting up. Well, of course they're bloodstains. I fought with these men, thinking they were footpads. If their blood has been spilled, it must be theirs or mine. Uh, Neville, I think you'd best accompany us to the authorities. <laughs> suggestion, we repair to the residence of Cloistrum's Lord High Mayor, Mr. Thomas Sapsee. And as we stood there in his parlor, the rendering of authority was as I knew it would be. Not unlike the person of Mr. Sapsee himself. Unimaginative, dull, stupid. Well, gentlemen, this all seems quite clear to me. Quite clear. <clears throat> And I am one who has spared little pain, little pain, gentlemen, in training myself to see things clearly. They may be clear to you, sir, but they are far from being so to me. Patience, young man, patience. Justice will be done here that you may rest well assured. Yes, well assured. <clears throat> and now, allow me to enumerate the situation. Point number one. There have been several witnessed quarrels between the two young men in question. Oh. The missing Edwin Drew to the here present Neville Landless. The quarrels have been repaired, sir. Mr. Jasper himself bears witness to that. I have stated there was no quarrel or apparent difference at your last meeting, Mr. Landis. Quite so, quite so. One meeting without quarrel, several with. The scales are unbalanced, I quote. Particularly one might say as the subject or object of those quarrels was the fiancée of Mr. 
Strood? Uh, surely, Mr. Sapsey, it is not necessary to bring a young lady's name into this. I apologize for the necessity, Mr. Jasper, but it would seem to me that the charming and delightful Miss Rosa is truly at the heart of the matter confronting us. At his heart, yes. In one respect, I am forced to agree with you. There is no doubt that Landis was extremely envious of Edwin's good fortune in being betrothed of Rosa. Yes, as I say, the heart. <coughs> now, point number two. The two gentlemen disappeared together into the night. Point number three. Mr. Drood never appears again. Point four. Mr. Landless is apprehended upon the heath, obviously fleeing close to him, and is returned only by force. Point five. Unexplained bloodstains are found upon his person and upon the stick he was carrying. I was not fleeing close to him, and the bloodstains are not unexplained. Circumstances indicate otherwise, Mr. Landless. Yes, otherwise. And the taking of a fellow creature's life is to take something that don't belong to you, you know. Taking of a fellow creature's... What, what madness is this? Oh, Mr. Jasper, surely you don't believe that... My interest I... lies only in the return of my nephew. And it is never to return in seeing that justice is rightly done. Yes, precisely what I had in mind, Mr. Jasper. Precisely. My further suggestions to Mr. Sapsey were immediately carried out. Placards were posted, the river dragged. A feverish search began. Days went by, then weeks. And the end result was nothing. No trace of Edwin Drew was ever found. Finally, when all hope was abandoned, Mr. Sapsey delivered his final resolution. Uh, it uh, would appear, gentlemen, that the uh, mystery of Edwin Drood has not as yet been solved. No, not solved. However, certain horrible suspicions as yet remain. In the interests of all concerned, therefore, I make the following suggestion. <coughs> it is that Mr. Neville Landless remove his presence from the city of Cloisterham, and unless there comes a time when certain horrible suspicions no longer exist, that he remain away from here forever. Late afternoon of that same day, I went to see Rosa. We met in the garden of the seminary house. You wish to see me, Mr. Jasper? That is a desire which has lived with me for a long while, Rosa. Only the unhappy circumstances of the past few weeks have prevented its fulfillment. And you feel that Mayor Sapes' announcement has now cleared the way for you? Not for me. For us. Grief does not come to an end with an official pronouncement, Mr. Jasper. Surely even the natural sadness you feel must be tinged with relief. Relief? You no longer are faced with the prospect of a forced, distasteful marriage to Edwin. You're free of your promise to your parents. Now that Edwin's gone, there's... There's nothing to prevent our getting married at once. Our oh, getting married? I'm sorry I put it so bluntly, my dear, but we waited so long, kept our love for each other buried so deeply. Surely you can't blame me for speaking so frankly now. No. And with Edwin gone, there's no need for me to be silent. You have my solemn word for it, Mr. Jasper. There is not one drop of love in my heart for you. Rather only loathing and hatred. Rosa! I've always despised you, though I tried to hide it for Edwin's sake. Despised you because you pursued me with your eyes, with your thoughts, whispering to me in your mind of your obscene love, even though I was engaged to Edwin. Edwin, the nephew you so falsely pretended, was the dearest thing on earth to you. Rosa, you're overwrought. Oh, the strain of these past weeks. You refuse to believe. I can't believe it, my dear. I love you, an old man. The man I love, the man I still love, is Neville Landless. Landless? Yes, Neville, the man I was going to marry. What do you mean, Rosa? You're going to marry Edwin? No, Mr. Jasper. You told me you were. That was before Edwin and I released each other from our vows, Mr. Jasper. Released? Then, Edwin didn't have to die. No, Mr. Jasper. Whether Edwin was alive or dead, I was free to marry the man of my choice.
bringing you Mr. Herbert Marshall in The Mystery of Edwin Drood. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater thrills, Suspense. Hello, our committee is investigating. And what have you found, Senator? That the Autolite Stay Full Battery... Needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Now, that's not all, Senator, because the Autolite Stay Full battery gives longer life, as proved by test conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. Yes, Harlow, and you know what's responsible. Why, those fiberglass retaining mats that surround every positive plate to reduce shedding and flaking and hold the power-producing materials in place. And we found the Autolite Stay Full battery is the favorite Millions of car owners from coast to coast. Thank you, Senator. Friends, see your Autolite battery dealer. He services all makes of batteries, and he has an Autolite stay full for your car if a replacement is needed. To quickly locate him, phone Western Union by number and ask for operator 25. I'll tell you the name of your nearest Autolite battery dealer where you can get an Autolite stay full, the battery that needs water only three times a year. In normal car use. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Herbert Marshall in Elliot Lewis's production of The Mystery of Edwin Drood, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. relate the ending of a world, the stunning collapse of all that has meaning, of all that is life. I will not attempt to do so. For everything that can be said was said on that fateful afternoon. And so the story of Edwin Drood was over. Or so I thought. Good day to you, Mr. Gust. Huh? Well, Oh, it's you, Duddles. Aye, him what is known as old Duddles, it be. Come to pay another visit to the resting place of the Orleans, Mr. Jasper. I no, no, Duddles. As a matter of fact, I hadn't even noticed that I was walking past the crypt. My mind was elsewhere, I imagine. I thought perhaps you might be coming round for another lesson in burying dead bodies, Mr. Jasper. What's meant by that about, Duddles? Well, now I recalls one night old Doddles gave you a lesson about finding bodies of the old ones. Up here and there with his hammer he did. Pointing out the hollow walls. Remembers, don't you? Oh, yes, yes. I believe I recall something like that. An evening without anything to do. Idle curiosity. I could have been, Mr. Jasper. Though it didn't seem as such on last Christmas Eve, it didn't. What about last Christmas Eve? Well, you was down here again, Mr. Jasper, tapping the walls with Doddle's hammer yourself, you was. You're mistaken. I was nowhere near the crypt on Christmas Eve. Perhaps. Perhaps. And I'll wager you had a bottle or two of holiday cheer beneath your belt at the time. Perhaps. Though, I would have swore it were you. <laughs> Come in. And who may you be, sir? Datcher is the name, Dick Datchery. Came calling, found you out, made myself at home. So I note. This? Favorite of mine, mulled wine. Thought I'd prepare, honor the occasion and all. The occasion of an absolute stranger making himself at home in my lodgings. Not ordinary circumstances, hmm? Quite agree. Nevertheless, honorable occasion... Then perhaps you'd care to explain, Mr. Datchery. Gladly. Gladly. <sighs> Perfect, sir. Won't you join me? I'm awaiting that explanation, sir. I bring you greetings, sir. 
Greetings from whom? Your dear boy, Mr. Jasper. Greetings from Edwin Root. Greetings from Edwin? I sent you the best. Apologize for not writing. Trust you're not worried. Told you, didn't I? Honorable occasion. Huh. Indeed, this is an occasion, Mr. Datchery. I've been uh, worried sick about the dear boy. You found him well? Blooming, best of health. Where is he? Where did you meet with him? London, some lodging house. Kept meeting on stairs, natural thing. Of course, quite natural. Business took me to Cloisterham, told Edwin. Made me promise a greeting. Here I am. Care to try the wine? Quite good. Uh, my apologies, Mr. Datchery. Yes, certainly I would. Toast to Edwin? To Edwin. Ah. Mm, perfect. Well, you're on my way now. Beauty over. Uh, one moment, Mr. Datchery. I, I must write Edwin and tell him how happy you've made me. What's the dear boy's address? You haven't got it. He moved. Didn't say where. Then there's no more you can tell me about him, where he can be reached? Nothing. I see. Wondering if it's a tall tale, Mr. Jasper. No real greeting. No real Edwin. Surely that's a possibility, Mr. Datchery. Ordinarily, not now. Mementos. Wanted you to have him. To remember him. Oh, uh, duties fully discharged. I'll be leaving. Good day, Mr. Jasper. Excellent one. <laughs> I scarcely heard him leave this Mr. Datchery. I was staring at the object he'd placed upon the table. A watch and chain. Edwin's watch and chain. He'd been wearing them the night of the big storm. The last night he'd been seen alive. Mr. Datchery! Mr. Jasper, one moment, please. Huh. Good afternoon, Rosa. Oh, have you heard the news, Mr. Jasper? What news, Rosa? It concerns Edwin Drood. Edwin? Yes, he's alive, Mr. Jasper. Edwin's alive. Oh, did you hear me, Mr. Jasper? Did you hear what I said about Edwin? He's alive. That's a rather astounding statement, Rosa. I know. I, I could scarcely believe it myself. But, but here. This came to me in the post today from London. It's a letter from Edwin. Oh, isn't it wonderful, Mr. Jasper? But we were all so certain that he was dead, that, that someone had killed him on the night of the storm. And there, there in your very hand is the proof that he's alive. No greater horror can visit the mind of man than the certain knowledge that he has suddenly become mad. And such was the horror which dwelt within me that fateful day. For it was the only explanation that was left. Edwin was dead, he had to be. The memory or dream that has lived with me since Christmas morn was too clear, too sharply etched for there to be any doubt. Edwin was dead. And yet within a single afternoon, two people have brought me proof that Edwin was alive. Proof as clear, as sharply edged as that memory. A sane mind does not exist in a world of such paradox. I'd gone mad. Time finds no haven within the dread confines of madness. Nor was that an exception. Somehow, without my knowing of it, the day was gone. In what had been a sunlit sky, a night's darkened storm lay muttering ominously. My spattered gaiters, bone-weary legs spoke mutely of hours of aimless wandering, hours of doing fruitless battle with that thing of horrible wonder apart, which was now my mind. And then I was where I'd been destined to be all along, the one place where the truth could be found, incontestable truth. I entered the venerable crypt of Cloister. Flashes of lightning etched in weird relief the ruined habitations of the dead. Half-standing pillars of stone assumed the attitude of watchful guardians, grinning evilly from their sentry boxes of the night. And the broken wall toward which I made my way was an ancient catacomb. 
concealing within it the secret that only I knew was there. I climbed to its top and looked down upon the rubbish that almost filled the hollow space between its sides. A rusty spade lay nearby. I seized it and began to dig. became meaningless. There was nothing but the feverish labor of uncovering the truth, of finding a rusted watch and chain that would not possibly lie bright and untarnished on my table, of uncovering a skeletonized human hand that was incapable of writing the letter I'd seen. And then the labor, too, became meaningless. There was no watch, no chain, no hand. There was nothing in there but rubble. Looking for something, Mr. Jasper? No. I asked you if you were looking for something, Mr. Jasper. What are you doing here? You were ordered to stay away from Cloyston. I came back, Mr. Jasper. Why? What are you doing here? Same thing that you are seeking the truth. The truth about what? The mystery of Edwin Drew. There is no mystery. Edwin Drew is alive. Is he? Ask Rosa. Ask Mr. Datchery. They'll tell you. They know he's alive. No, Mr. Jasper. You killed him last Christmas Eve. Edwin Drew is dead. He's not. I tell you. How could he be? If he were dead, why isn't he lying in this grave? The grave in which I... The grave in which you buried him? No. There was no grave. Only a dream. It was all a dream. What was a dream, Mr. Jasper? Everything. Pouring him back to the river. My hands around his throat. Hiding his body here in this wall. It was all a dream. Can't you understand? I've been driven out of my mind by a dream. I didn't do it. But you did, Mr. Jasper. You're a fool, man. Just look for yourself. This grave I prepared for him is empty. He isn't there. No, but he was here until two weeks ago. Two weeks ago? That was when a London detective and I found what was left of him. Actually? Yes. With the help of Durbles and his invaluable hammer, we found Edwin Drood. Found the watch which identified him. You told me just now how you killed him. The watch. And Rosa's letter. Written several years ago. Reposted from London. Shall we go now, Mr. Jasper? Go? No. You took me before the authorities once. Now it's my time to take you. <laughs> Prospect of the gallows make you happy, Jasper? It's a way, Lenz. At least I'll go to it. Knowing that I wasn't mad. Presented by Autolite, tonight's star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite, world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. That's why during the early months of this year, as we did a year ago, the Autolite family will join together in saluting the leading car manufacturers who install Autolite products as original equipment. Our Autolite family includes some 30,000 men and women in Autolite plants in the United States, Canada, and many foreign countries, and the 18,000 people who have invested a portion of their savings in Autolite, as well as thousands of Autolite distributors and dealers, and the many leading manufacturers who use Autolite products as original equipment. Our Autolite family will salute the DeSoto division of Chrysler Corporation on the next Autolite Suspense television program. If you live in a television area, check the day and time of suspense so that you will be sure to see this program. Next week, we recreate an historical puzzle as we attempt to locate a sunken treasure... The story, based on fact, is called Gold of the Adomar. Our star, Mr. John Hodiak. That's next week on Suspense.
Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The Mystery of Edwin Drood was adapted from Charles Dickens' unfinished novel by Sidney Marshall. In tonight's story, Ben Wright was heard as landless. Featured in the cast were Betty Harford, Joseph Kearns, Ramsey Hill, Charles Davis, and William John Stone. And remember, next week, Mr. John Hodiak in Gold of the Adomar. This is the CBS Radio Network.